Welcome back to Juice's Arthropods. My name is Juice, and today we're going to be talking about the Pink Dragon Millipede, or rather the Thailand Pink Dragon Millipede, Desmoxix planata. So Juice, you might ask me, why are you making a differentiation between Thailand Pink Dragon Millipede, Desmoxis planata? Because this species is a pain. Everybody uses common names in the industry, and that's fine. But this one, in particular, has screwed everybody up in the hobby. There's lots of vendors who sell arthropods, and there are some of them that know anything about arthropods. And the word Pink Dragon Millipede has been just this flag that I'm going to plant on and I'm going to die on this hill alone but the problem with it is that there are shocking pink dragon millipedes pink dragon millipedes and Thailand pink dragon millipedes you hear how stupid all of that sounds and guess what they're all different species so this is why it's very important for all of the care guide I talk about today that we were referring to specifically for Desmoxis planata they only grow about one inch or three centimeters. So if you have something that's huge, don't watch this video about them. So now that I've showcased the fact that they are very different species, no matter what people might say, that you need to ensure that these species, what's really cool about this particular species is that now that they've become very abundant in the trade, people are still kind of unsure of what to do with them because, you know, with millipedes, it's sink or swim. You either know what you're doing or you don't. This particular species, though, has some tricks that make it actually much, much easier to take care of than any other millipede uh, species. The issue, though, is that they are expensive right now. In time, that won't be a problem because, honestly, these are the easiest to breed, easiest to take care of millipedes. So let's first start with diet. When it comes to diet, these guys have the exact same kind of diet as you would have with isopods. Uh, essentially, leaf litter, rotten vegetation, rotten uh, soil, rotten everything. If it's rotten, they want it. Now, the also added benefit is that these guys, the same as isopods, will take things like organic butternut squash or any other vegetables that you want to give them. Um, they also will take proteins very well. So often what I'll do with these guys is I'll offer them some koi pellets. Now, they're not big eaters, so, so don't put like a lot of proteins in there because inevitably what you're going to get is mold and you're going to get any other like fruit flies or anything like that. Um, but you can add a little bit of protein in there. Little shrimp, basically you treat them exactly like you treat them with an isopod. They're very, very easy to deal with. One thing that is going to happen with these guys though is a lot of mold. So what you need to do is you need to ensure that you have a good springtail population in there. I and mine have orange springtails and uh, regular springtails. Both of them are available on my website now. They work perfectly because what happens is the orange springtails tend to go a little bit deeper in the soil. The uh, temperate white springtails kind of stand on top and it just covers you for the mold that's going to happen. Now, mold is fine, guys. This is a problem that I hear a lot of people worrying about, and unless you're dealing with tarantulas, mold is not your enemy. There are some molds that are bad, but all the mold that is gonna be found naturally in any of their terrariums that you're bringing in, as long as the soil is sanitized and you didn't bring it out from outdoors, is gonna be totally fine. So with these guys in particular, because of the humidity, which we'll talk about in a minute, you are going to have a lot of white molds. Do not worry. These guys will eat some of that as well, as well as the springtails will. So as far as diet, to reiterate, fresh veggies, totally fine. Please make sure that they're organic. Uh, proteins are fine, such as koi pellets, fish pellets, any of the kind of pellets you might put on top of a fish tank that like kind of float a little bit. And other than that, these guys are going to be super great with the rotten wood and the rotten leaf litter. Treat them like any other millipede and you'll be awesome with these guys. Now, when it comes to care, this species is the easiest millipede species you are ever going to work with. I, I swear to you. All you need is a box and soil and rotten vegetation and wood. That's it. Yeah. Honestly, like there's no additional needs for these at all because you're not really going to see them that often. You ever lifted up like a piece of wood and then you found millipedes underneath it? It's kind of the same. These aren't big millipedes. They're not showy millipedes. It's not like when you have a giant African millipede, how they're going to like make themselves known. You might see them on top of the soil, but I'm going to be honest, they're only three centimeters long. So at the biggest that these guys even get, they're only like maybe double the size of a larger isopod. So put them in whatever container you want. But at the end of the day, if you want to put them in just like a shoebox with ventilation, it really doesn't matter. I mean, they're going to do well 
as long as you have proper ventilation because they do need very high humidity at the end of the day. They're from Thailand. So you're going to treat them very similar, actually, like you would the rubber ducky isopods. So keep that in mind. And But there is some saving grace here. They way outbreed the rubber ducky isopod and they're much easier to deal with. There is far less worries about killing them off like you would any other Thailand species. Now let's talk about humidity. Basically treat it like it's a tropical jungle because that's how these guys do best. You want the soil to be damp, if not wet. You want plenty of places for them to kind of go around. I'll show some uh, video here. Essentially what I do is I have a cork bark sitting in one area. I've got all the moss in another area in case you don't want to look at the bee reel for some reason. Um, and I just have like little areas for them to climb underneath. All of the soil I put in there was actually made with rotting wood and or was con like literally made of rotting wood, like the flake soil that I put in a lot of my bins. So it's going to just, they're going to climb deep down inside of that and they're going to be good. Humidity, I just have a couple vents in there. But other than that, I want it to be like when I have the lid on top, I want the humidity to be kind of clinging to the top. You want it to be nice and damp and wet. They don't do really well uh, with dry. They actually desiccate very easily. So I don't want to say treat this like a paludarium, but somewhere between a paludarium and a normal terrarium. So I would say pretty similar to like what you would have, like maybe a little bit drier than poison dart frogs. Uh, they're going to do great with high humidity. I'm going to say 80s, 90s, you're going to want to keep them at. If you go into the 70s, you'll be fine as well. But just know the more humidity you have for these guys, the better. Um, but just note, do not make it wet, wet. And what I mean by that is if you can squeeze water out of the soil, you're going to drown them. So just make sure that it's a damp, not soaking. Side note before I talk about fecundity. Um, these particular species are unlike any millipede you typically will see out there. What I mean by that is if you have people who are afraid of centipedes, this is going to trigger that response a little bit for them. They are very unique uh, looking, and we'll, I really want to talk about that more in the pros and cons, but just like freaking look at these things. Like, yeah, we have a care guide here, but again, look at them. They're nuts looking. Anyhow, on to fecundity. They have a lot of babies, like a, a lot of babies. If you don't want these as a lot of them, do not buy them. They are like powder blue isopods of millipedes. You start with five and now you have a thousand. And um, there's a huge con about having a boatload of these, which is you can't feed them off to anything. So just note that when you do purchase these, you are going to have a pretty much constantly producing box of them, which is awesome i mean it's great don't get me wrong like they will you can create really beautiful you know terrariums that have them and you could add all kinds of just like an awesome ecological terrarium that you could have them and some roaches and isopods and yeah they're all going to compete for food but that competition is going to keep them from outbreeding themselves so by all means go crazy with that but if you're looking for a pet that doesn't breed heavily I don't recommend these guys because when it comes to fecundity, they have a lot of babies, like a lot, a lot. And also, and this is the last thing, if you change the soil, do not throw this soil outside because this species can become highly, highly invasive. It started in like Sri Lanka and now it's native in like 12 different countries because again, they will outbreed the comp competition every single time. Let's talk about pros. Look, I might not seem like I'm super excited about these, and I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I'm not. I, I love all arthropods, but millipedes just, they're, they're one of these things that they're like the cats of the arthropod world. They mostly sleep and don't do a lot else. So they were essentially just like a, a, like a, like a cactus that you kind of stare at. But this particular species, I find the absolute, well, I'm going to say the second coolest millipede by far only beaten by the giant african millipedes and that's because of their sheer size but we'll do another video about those guys the pink dragon millipede is one of those species that when you look at it you're like that's a centipede and it's not no toxic cognats doesn't have two pairs of leg per body segment it's just dope it's armored it's pink and uh if you haven't figured that out by now by 
any of the things that I'm constantly doing. Pink and purple are just like one of my favorite colors. So what I'm what I'm saying is if you want like a dope pink ranger from like Mighty Morphin Power Rangers looking bug that kind of looks like a centipede, this is it. It is just awesome. And the spikes, again, kind of like a dope goth uh, millipede at the end of the day. It just has spikes everywhere. And I don't know why, because it comes packed with... <laughs> with the most brutal cyanide, which I'll talk about in a second on the cons. So I don't even understand why it has those spikes. It doesn't need them. It just wanted to look evolutionarily awesome. So yeah, that's a huge thing. Secondarily, easy. Millipedes are hard sometimes, sometimes impossible. There are plenty of species out there that you just cannot breed. These you can breed, which is if you're someone that wants to get into breeding arthropods, this is a perfect starter species. This is as easy to breed these guys as it is to breed powder blues. You put them in a box, you put some humidity and food in there, and you will have babies. It is awesome. So secondarily, awesome to breed, easy species. Third pro for me, um, I really am a fan of just like little tiny e uh, ecosystems in a box. In all the mold that kind of sprouts up with all the humidity, you get to see how they interact with it, and that's awesome. Uh, last pro, if I had to guess, is the fact that, like, these are kind of bringing, it's the same thing as, like, regal jumping spiders. This is bringing people into the, into the hobby for isopods. And again, I love any creature that can get people interested in bugs. I love them. Absolutely love them. So, hey, if myriapods are your thing, please, by all means, uh, go for these guys. Hugely sweet, awesome species. Let's talk about cons. Let's go back to fecundity for a second. If you don't have a place to put the extras, you will find massive die-offs because in any ecological system, a long enough timeline, there's not enough food to sustain it. So one of the biggest cons is the fact that they are like unchecked chaos when it comes to how much they can breed. Now keep in mind, my internal in my house humidity is about 50% at all times. I'm in California. It may not be the same for you in your state, so what I'm saying is just be prepared for this because you need to have a plan B on how you might have to artificially create a devastating ecological disaster to control that or just lower their food. And that's also another option. Um, another con is they produce hydrofluoric cyanide. So what that means is don't hold them. Like you, you can, but like, you shouldn't because like you're not going to absorb it into your hands but like how much do you trust yourself on your ability to wash your hands when that thing you're washing off is hydrofluoric cyanide i'm i'm asking this because like if covid taught us nothing it was that most of the country didn't know how to wash their hands they needed a damn song for it so do you trust yourself with hydrofluoric cyanide before you go and eat your sandwich so all I'm saying is maybe just don't eat something after you hold them, which Juice told you not to hold them. So ignore my cinnamon if you want to, but just know, like, either, either hold them and wash your hands very good or don't hold them at all. Um, which also leads to the third con. What do you plan on doing with all these babies? Because you can't feed them off. You, it's not like powder blues where you can just like add them to other things, maybe give them to your gecko in hopes that they'll de demolish them or put them in your Horrid King Assassin Bugs container because they'll take care of them. Like you need to have a plan because they are poisonous to everything else. And this includes small dogs, cats, pets, and children. So I'm mentioning all of this because I want you to think ahead before you purchase these because while they are not dangerous to you and you won't die, you might get sick. Like it's enough cyanide to give you um, a lot of exiting all of the thing in your bowels that you didn't want to leave at a uh, accelerated rate. Is that the PG-13 way of saying that? So there you go. Don't eat them. Don't hold them and then not wash your hands. Don't let your kids eat them. Definitely don't let your pets eat them. Just, they should just be a no-no because they're bright pink, guys. And what that means is that there has been, they did not care if they got found in the wilderness because they have proven otherwise why it's a bad idea to consume them. So take that advice 
And as far as cons, that's honestly it. They're poisonous. Don't eat them. That's all I'm saying. And I'm going to get comments that are like, oh, why would you eat them? I don't know. People eat weird shit. Just don't eat them. So as far as that, I hope you like this video. Uh, like and subscribe. Hit the bell because a lot of people have been saying they're not seeing my videos lately. So hope you enjoyed this. I hope this helps you. And honestly, for a starter pet, top five easily. Enjoy.